Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Black Hat. Uh, this is a light bulb worm with Colin O'Flynn. Before we begin, there are a few brief notes. Um, we'd like to make sure that you stop by the business hall located downstairs in Bayside A, B. The Black Hat Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level three. And of course, the Arsenal reception is tonight at 1700. For those who don't do military time, that's 5 p.m. If you haven't picked up your merchandise at the Black Hat store, today is your last chance to visit and the bookstore and the swag store, okay? Also, visit the Kali Linux Lab in Mandalay Bay A today. It's a good time. Thank you all for putting your phone on vibrate to not disrupt the talk. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I present Colin O'Flynn. All right. Thank you for making it here early. Everyone looks great. Had lots of coffee or something like that. Um, so I'm Colin O'Flynn, and I started working on this talk quite a while ago to sort of answer the question on how secure is this Philips Hue type system. And, and it came about someone asking me, like, you know, could you have a worm go between these light bulbs? Um, so that's the question mark in the, in the title. Uh, we have sort of a special guest presentation with us today. So this is like when you go to a concert and the opening act is way better than the main act. This is roughly what's happening here. Um, so A.L. Ronan had actually contacted me after I submitted the talk and it got published. And he said, oh, I'm actually looking at this too. So I'm in Canada, he's in Israel, two totally separate researchers um, coming to a lot of the same conclusions. And he's pushed it even further to give a really cool demo here on some bugs he found in the light bulb itself. So there's a whole separate mini talk in the middle of this. So I hope you learn something and have fun uh, during the process. So I'm behind a project called Chip Whisperer. Um, this was, there was a Kickstarter for this Chip Whisperer light. And if you're interested in it, so this does all sorts of advanced hardware hacking type work. Uh, I'm actually giving a talk in the Arsenal Theater at like 2 p.m. and uh, there's a demo at the Arsenal table at uh, 4 p.m and have some blank circuit boards and stuff to give away there too. So if you want to build one, it's all this open source, you know, everyone loves open source hardware, software type thing. All right, so what is the Philips Hue? If you haven't heard about it, basically it's this internet connected wireless light bulb. Um, so you can see a few of them there. There's a few different like um, little bulb devices. So, you know, these are the bulbs here. Um, and they communicate using a low power wireless protocol uh, at the lower layer, it's a standard called 802.15.4. On top of that, it's called Zigbee, which you might have heard of. Um, on top of that, there's another stack called Zigbee Light Link ZLL. And a bunch of manufacturers make ZLL compliant bulbs. It's not proprietary to Philips Hue. Uh, they're simply probably the biggest and most popular version of them. So they make the most interesting bulb to look at. Um, and all of them talk, so there's a bridge device. This is the bridge 1.0 there, that round thing. Um, and it connects, so it has on the back here, there's an ethernet port and that connects to your, you know, network and your internet and everything. And then it's talking the ZLL protocol to the bulbs itself. So that's sort of the, uh, what they call the bridge device um, or coordinator in Zigbee speak. So it bridges between the ethernet and the rest of it. So right away you could think about, okay, what sort of hacks can we do in the system? And this is sort of where we start thinking about the security vulnerabilities. Um, so the bulbs themselves, each of these bulbs has firmware that goes on it, so a little software package you can load. Um, so maybe you could load malicious firmware that just destroys it. Um, maybe you could take control of the bulbs in someone's house and you know turn it on and off or make it more difficult to control, move it onto another network. Um, maybe we could hack into the bridge. So this bridge has you know uh, this wireless interface and it's not Wi-Fi again, it's this other standard. Um, that's maybe not as well known. Maybe there's a way over that to actually access the ethernet. And the final thing is, you know, you could have malware on the bulbs possibly. We know we have over the air updates for the bulbs. They're running little bits of software. Um, could you do something with that? Could you use that to uh, take data out of a network? So Elia actually has a pretty interesting paper um, that talks specifically about that. So that was some of his previous research too. Um, so you can really see how much data you can, you can pull out with this. All right, so how does the ZLL work? How does a bulb join the network? So you know, you, you get home, you open your package, you have some bulbs, you have this bridge device. Um, they've got to somehow securely communicate. 
And basically what happens is the bulb talks to the uh, bridge device with a, a link key, so this, this down here, it's an encrypted key, so it's randomly generated per network and it's all the same per network. To transfer the key from the bridge to the light bulb, uh, you have this issue, right, how do, you, how do you do that? They don't use asymmetric crypto uh, for basic reasons of they think the, the light bulb was too small uh, to run something like that, so you can, you can question that, but it's not a totally invalid assumption. Um, so what they do is they have a master key, and it's the same key used by every single ZLL device, not just Philips, everyone that makes this. Um, it's in the standard, but not published, uh, so it's supposed to be super secret. They use that to encrypt the key that the, the random key that's generated, they send it over the air to the bulb, um, and now the bulbs can talk uh, securely. Uh, that key's been leaked, of course, you know, no surprise that happened, and that was published, like, I don't know, a year or two ago, it's been known that that's been leaked. Um, it does mean, though, the, the leak of that key, it means you can only potentially take over a bulb or, you know, sniff the joining process if you just walk into an area with a network, um, you're not going to be able to get the, the network key just by that uh, master key leak. So um, Zigbee has published sort of a little note, as Elio pointed out, actually, that, you know, oh, it's not a big deal, don't worry about it, type thing. So there, there's an actual document stating that. Um, so now I'm going to push it over here to uh, give a really cool overview of the attack and a bit of a demo. So these lights over here aren't just for accent. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Colin. Um, again, my name is Eyal Ronen. I'm a PhD student at uh, Weizmann Institute of uh, Science in Israel. I'm going to show some intermediate results I'm having on an, on, in an ongoing research I'm conducting together with my advisor, Professor Adi Shamir, and Mr. Achior Wagenton. Um, I've been uh, researching IoT device security. Uh, my previous work, as Colin said, was extended functionality attacks against IoT devices, which uh, mainly using the IP interface to cause unintended result in the physical world. And uh, recently, I've also started looking at the possibility of uh, creating a Zigbee worm. Um, so I've been doing stuff very similar to what uh, Colin is uh, going to show here. Um, actually, downing the same uh, code from Godfed to try to attack the hardware and extract keys. Uh, but after talking with Colin, and as he is much better than this and than I am, I decided to try to have a closer look at the Zigbee protocol side. Um, so as Colin said, there is a mechanism, it's called the uh, touch link in ZLL that allows a controller to instruct uh, a light to join his own personal network and then transfer uh, his uh, unique encryption keys to, so the light can work. Um, of course, we don't want any attacker that uh, is in Zigbee uh, range that can be up to 400 meters outside to just to be able to uh, direct your lights to go to his network and steal them away from you. Uh, so uh, as a security precaution, there is a distance checking mechanism that uh, ensures that the lamp is in very close physical proximity to the controller. You can probably not see, but uh, here is a Philips uh, U website uh, frequently asked question that states that the Philips switch can only con uh, take control of a light if it's in about 15 centimeters away from here. However, um, in our attack, we were able to take full control of uh, pre-installed Philips U lights from very large distances. We actually built a fully autonomous attack kit using only off-the-shelf uh, evaluation board and the same chip that was used in the older Philips U models. Uh, and to demonstrate that, we tried to do some little war driving and some war flying, and we will see it soon. We made a full ethical disclosure to Philips Lightning. They've taken the, the matter very seriously. They've already um, uh, confirmed and fixed this vulnerability, but as this attack affects almost their entire line of products, they have a lot of work doing the testing for all the vi different versions. Um, they notified me that the OTA updates are supposed to start rolling by the end of this month. And so, of course, we will give them the time to try to uh, update all of the lights uh, before publishing the exact technical details. Uh, but in the meantime, I can show you some really nice demos. So uh, our first demo was Zigbee World Driving. We tried to take over lamps that we uh, pre-installed in uh, office rooms and campus. Oh, sorry. So, no video? Okay, so this is me driving the car. You can maybe try to see the reflection of the lights starting to flicker. 
and uh, this is the the rooms we installed the, the lights in, and this is done uh, from about 70 meters away while driving against traffic. Um, so we managed to do that. We thought, okay, that's nice, uh, but we want to do something a little bit more exciting, and I really wanted to have the chance to fly this really cool $4,000 drone. So we mount our attack kit on this drone, and we try to choose a really inst interesting target. So I don't know if you can really see it in the picture, but this is a very interesting office building. It, it's hosting some very well-known uh, security companies, and uh, also the Israeli CERT. So um, I want to run our attack kit, and okay. So you can see this video. The building is about 350 meters away. That's more than three uh, American football fields, as I was mentioned before. And this is the drone taking all uh, up. And uh, you can see the evaluation board hanging below it, like one meter. And you can already see the lights starting to flicker in the distance. <laughs> and uh, we are now approaching, basically approaching the building. As we get nearer, the Zigbee channel becomes a little bit more reliable. So we're able to affect more lamps, and the effect becomes a little bit more regular. And uh, basically now we can do the second phase of our attack. Those of you who are familiar with Morse code might notice that the lights are currently uh, crying for help. They are signaling <laughs> SOS repeatedly as they are now under my, our uh, full control. So, thank you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we try to take, we said we'll take our chances with a live demo. I really hope it will work. So uh, basically what we have is two Philips light bulbs. They are uh, in the same network as this controller, which I can control using the Philips U open API, which is really nice. I have a little Python script, and hopefully the demo will run, and you can see I can control them. Everything works fine. So to prove to you that I'm not lying, I'm going to disconnect the controller. I will take my very professional attack kit that I just removed from the drone and power it up. Use besides. And you can see the lights uh, flickering. In a few seconds, hopefully, the, uh, the second phase of our attack will start. And again, the lights will start to uh, single out SOS. If you can see them, if someone wants to help them, it will be very nice. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so thank you. So as I mentioned, that is completely unrelated to my research, so I get zero credit. If you have any questions or you want to say how amazing it is, solely to him, not me. Um, so I'm just gonna go really quickly through some of the other details of the teardown, and this will give us something to look forward to once you publish those details so that people can see how it works. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, how would we get like light bulb malware or brick? So as we mentioned, there's this over the air firmware update. Um, and Philips is actually pretty good with the security. This is what we both discovered, is they do a pretty good job, all things considered. Um, the firmware is encrypted on the server. Uh, it's downloaded and encrypted. It's sent over the air, um, encrypted again, but with a key that we can potentially figure out. Um, so th everything's there for the, the light bulb worm, basically. Uh, the, the ZLL key has been leaked. We know it's possible to, to oops, forgot to switch it, sorry. Uh, we know it's possible to steal bulbs. Um, you can put custom firmware on the bulbs. They have over the air updates. We know that's definitely possible uh, because we've seen them do it before. And we know there will shortly be another over the air update. So we can watch that happen. Um, it, so it's entirely possible technically to cause these bulbs to send out signals to act as a bridge uh, to take over nearby bulbs. And this is like what you would need to make a worm. Uh, so let's tear apart the bulbs. These are the bulbs that are in those lamps. These are really cheap. They're like $15 Canadian even, which is amazing. Normally in Canada, it's like $5 US, $30 Canadian or something. Um, so they're really cheap. Inside them, there's an Atmel radio, this Mega 2564RFR2. Um, and with this talk, there's, there's a white paper. It's up now on oflin.com, and it'll be up on the Black Hat website. It has all the details of this, where the test points are. You can reprogram these with JTAG, so you can't download the firmware off them. They're locked, but you can use it as a dev kit. Um, as of yet, there's no updates for that, though, over the air, so we can't see the, how the update process works. That's going to change soon. 
So instead, I'm looking at a different bulb. Uh, these are an older one. They use a different chip, a TICC2530, um, and there has been an over-the-air update already for it. So we can rip it apart. Um, you can put 3.3 volts in so you're not killing yourself using, you know, 120 volts. Um, and we can watch it. So I'm doing like a, a firmware update hacking here. Basically watch it as it, it does the firmware update. So I have a, um, the bulb is off to the side here and there's a little connector on the spy flash. Uh, it's monitoring the logic signals as that happens and then the bridge here is just doing the update. So I just have it out of the case because I had already taken it apart. You don't need it out of the case for this. Um, and basically you can see it takes like an hour-ish to download. So it slowly downloads the new firmware. Um, what this is is this is the spy data traffic. So I'm actually watching data written to flash memory on the, the light bulb itself. And I'm just watching that while it's doing the whole download. So it takes quite a while. Um, and I'm using a Sally Logic Pro here to be able to record these super long traces. Um, once it downloads, it then resets and it goes into this special, uh, into bootload mode. Uh, so this is very quick. So it's downloaded the data to an onboard flash. It does the update in two passes. The first pass is it just verifies the signature um, in the data. So it verifies it's a valid image. The second pass, it takes that data and it begins decrypting it. Um, and you can see this because there's, I can see it's reading, you know, it starts at address zero, reads through, restarts. Um, and as I go through in the white paper, there's some delay due to physical effects of how you're writing to memory. Um, what's of most interest to us is looking at that, I was able to figure out there's basically a flag byte in the, the flash memory. Um, and I can write that flag byte to force it to really quickly do these updates. Um, so this means I can, you know, download a firmware, do the update, and force it to keep redoing it. So this is a, a critical step in helping me to hack the, the system or understand how it's working at least. Um, to understand that, I'm pulling on some research done by Travis Goodspeed, and basically the deal with these devices is that they're locked to prevent you from reading out the, uh, the flash memory. Uh, you can erase the device though, and you can't read out the flash memory, but you can read out the RAM, so the state of what it was up to uh, at the point you erased it. On the downside, it kills the device. So um, if you're doing like, if you're buying these, which are pretty expensive where I am anyway, then you have, you've got to buy a bunch of them. So I only did a little bit of work on these bulbs actually. Um, and to do this, basically, I made some custom hardware that watches for that update process to happen, enters debug, and erases the device, and then dumps the SRAM. Um, so it's just like a little Arduino-ish type device you can use. Uh, what's interesting here is that this is, a, this is a dump of the RAM, and basically we can start to see stuff like the data I sent back to it is highlighted in red in the middle here. So this was the encrypted firmware. Um, if it does a in-place decryption, so it reads that encrypted data, it decrypts it and then writes it somewhere. Uh, we'd like to get at that decrypted data. And we can use a little bit of a trick here. Uh, and I'm gonna switch to, this is from the, the Bridge 1.0, which uses the same chip, but it's easier to demonstrate. We use a little trick here where, uh, you know, you write the device a block of encrypted data, it decrypts it, it sends back a message that says okay, like receive, please send the next one. And this is, you know, really common. All bootloaders have something like this. Um, looking into the SRAM itself, um, they have a little chunk of five bytes or six bytes or however many are there that I can't count that's the transmit buffer. Uh, so this is the okay to send back message. So looking at the RAM, I can say, oh, that's what it sends back to me. There's the, the transmit buffer. Um, and it has a little loop that goes through like the, the transmit routine and it just writes each character of that buffer and it says write five characters. Uh, we can use something called glitch attacks which cause it to screw this comparison up. Uh, so basically it ends up writing an invalid number once and so instead of it thinking, you know, I starts at zero, maybe I starts at five or six. So that comparison will keep failing until it overflows. Uh, and this basically means we're going to get a whole bunch of data because it's going to keep reading from what it thinks is a much larger array and it's just going to tell us what's in, um, in the RAM buffer. So we don't have to do this erase thing that's really uh, annoying and makes us kill a lot of devices. Uh, so I built a custom board that I put the, I desoldered a chip from the bridge, put it on this custom board, and this custom board lets me insert the clock glitches here. So, uh, so if you're interested in seeing more demos of the clock glitching stuff, by the way, come by either the Arsenal talk or the uh, Arsenal, I'll have a demo as well where you can 
talk more relaxed. But basically we insert some invalid clock pulses and I'm doing this through my open source chip whisperer uh, light project and it causes the, the counter to screw up and write an invalid value. And what you get is you just, you know, it sends back the expected response here at, at the first little thing circled in red um, here and then it just keeps reading. It says, okay, I got the expected response. Um, I'm now gonna send back all this other data and that's what's sort of all this stuff here. So I've sort of highlighted at the bottom there that RX buffer starting 2A00, 0, 0, 0, 01, 0, 01, et cetera. Um, so we definitely know that works. Um, and it, it re re reads further from RAM so it, it keeps going onward. Uh, and this is actually, it turns out that they did a pretty good job here because what they do is after they decrypt it, it seems they write FFs. Um, so they clear it. They decrypt it, use it, and then clear it to make it a very narrow window where this type of attack would work. So it's actually a good practice. So this was sort of an interesting thing when I'm saying again, there's quite a few steps taken to stop you uh, from hacking these devices. It might be possible with better time glitches. And this was like a graveyard of, when I said you had to erase them and then throw them out, this is what you end up with. Um, these are the bridge 1.0, so they released a 2.0 which it made it cheap to buy a bunch of the old ones. The 2.0 uh, bridges, they use Linux so they're more fun to hack. Um, it turns out to be pretty easy. They, they have unique root passwords, again, very good. Uh, we can use a paperclip to bypass this though, a paperclip and a UART. Um, so I have a video that you can see, basically there's a serial port. Um, you short out the flash memory chip when it's booting. It gets an invalid device, so it's this device here are not available. And then you just write your own boot, uh, root password and you're done. Um, and then you have root, so that's great, that's amazing. But they are unique root passwords, so that's a, again a very nice security feature here. Um, so it's fun for us as hackers, but it's bad if you're, someone was trying to, you know, attack it from the outside. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here, so I do zero software, I hate software I should say, I like doing hardware stuff. Uh, so I haven't really looked into reversing the binary besides playing with strings and a few things. There's one binary though that has like the web server, it's dealing with incoming packets, it's dealing with Zigbee stuff, so it seems like maybe, that doesn't seem ideal, let's say. Um, so I encourage people to look into that. Uh, there's a software update routine which has AES-256 decryption on it. Uh, unfortunately, the there's just a file with the keys and the keys seem to be the same between devices. Um, but we already have the whole decrypted update because we have root anyway, so that's, sure it's an attack, but it's not really interesting. Uh, the final thing I did is looked at power analysis on um, a little part of the Zigbee system on a chip device here. And basically I'm trying to figure out um, how is the bootloader on this device working? Is it the same as the light bulbs? You know, this could give us a really interesting attack vector and a way to get into these devices, um, a way to understand how the update's going to see what the keys might be. So this is a, a bridge that square board, it's mounted on a special development board I've made to help me do the power analysis. Uh, I can do a, a firmware update, I can see some weird waveforms and um, if you look at the waveforms, if you do crypto stuff, you'll see like, okay, there's 64 bytes, uh, there's four repeated blocks, so each one's probably dealing with 16 bytes. Within that, there's about 10 similar-ish looking or like really nine similar-ish looking and one slightly different um, sort of signature. It's probably doing AES uh, 128, there's 10 rounds in that. What type of AES is it is the only real question. Um, and so I used a Atmel dev board. I loaded Atmel's uh, example AES crypto libraries of different modes of AES. And what you end up finding is that AES in counter mode looks highly suspiciously similar. It's probably hard to see from these. In the white paper, they're, they're overlaid closer. Um, it looks very suspiciously similar that this is probably AES counter mode. Uh, that actually makes side channel analysis slightly more complex, not totally impossible, um, but that's now ongoing work. So we've, with the power analysis, being able to figure out a lot more of how that firmware update works. So, real quick conclusions here. Um, obviously it's a huge risk if that worm ever came to exist, but it's pretty good. They, they've done a pretty good job actually. Um, so you know, there's some bugs here and there, there's some issues. But it has encrypted firmware, keys aren't in SRAM, firmware is signed, um, and they're clearing memory when they're done with it. The, the trade-offs are that 
Uh, they do use the same key, so we can see that you know it's the same binary downloaded to every light bulb. So every one of those bulbs in the world, at least of the same model number, is using the same key. Um, you would have liked to see some sort of unique key to prevent the spread of a worm. Um, the ZLL master key has been leaked. It's not really their fault. That's sort of, sort of a design thing. And there's probably a, there's a pretty big Linux binary there that's suspiciously large for how much stuff is in it. Uh, but yeah, see the white paper for more. So as I mentioned, um, Elia has the really cool demo and video. So if you want to see that, uh, you can go to his website, which is also linked from oflin.com, which might be faster to write down. Um, I think we might have like one minute for a question here. I don't know if there's any. Otherwise, we'll talk to you afterwards. But thank you again, Elia, for coming here. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Colin, for inviting me. And uh, again, thank you for the Black Hat team that uh, borrowed those uh, table lamps from uh, the hotel. <laughs>